Namaste, everybody. Welcome to another exciting chat on uh, Bharat Varta. Today, we have a very interesting and young guest with us, uh, Arjun Singh Kadir. He's written a very interesting book on Haryana. Um, it sounds, well, I think this has raised a lot of questions. Ki Haryana pe book kaise likha hai? But trust me, after having read the book, I can say that this book is definitely worth referring to. Worth going through and has lots of interesting tri tidbits, trivia, which are not only related to Haryana, but have had a longer term impact on the history of India itself. So um, I welcome Arjun to this podcast of Bharat Vartha. Welcome Arjun and tell us something about yourself, your background to start with. Thank you very much for inviting me for this conversation. Thank you Bharat Vartha. Thank you Amiji. Uh, glad to be chatting with you after this longer time now. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm an academic and uh, now an author, I'd like to call myself or some, some, sometime later, uh, I'd like to call myself, uh, but professionally I'm an acad uh, academic and I teach geology. Apart from that, I'm engaged in, uh, I run a non-profit also called Rath Foundation and I've started a few forums in Haryana, which talk and discuss about numerous challenges that the Haryanvi society is facing today. And it's important that, you know, my, the motivation is to help contextualize where Haryana is coming from, to understand where it is today and to then decide uh, or talk about better choices that Haryanvis can make for a better tomorrow and consequently a better India to make. Um, apart from that, uh, I'm working with different capacities with other public policy institutions and foundations and building my profile thereon. Uh, I've been active in uh, Haryana for quite a while. I spent some time working in the chief minister's office, Haryana also. And over time, I've been building this profile where I dabble between, um, you know, policy, social work, academia, in order to understand and get a holistic picture of what Haryana is today. And that's been the journey so far. I hope to keep on contributing. The first book is out uh, and titled Land of the Gods. And I'm, uh, you know, pretty... Uh, happy with the response I'm getting, the response the book is getting, because um, early back in the day, uh, you, you're a published author yourself, and you know that there's this uh, challenge uh, to get a national publisher to write about, you know, things, because publishers tend to think about uh, the business part of it, um, and how much the book is going to sell, and things like that. And in that regard, there were naturally a few questions raised uh, on would people be interested to know about Haryana or like, yeah. people or would Haryanvis also be interested in reading about Haryana, uh, which reminded me of, you know, uh, this Actually, is that was my question that did you expect that the book will do so well and get such warm reception? Well, I hope it, uh, I knew at a certain point, I thought that, you know, there's fresh information. Uh, this is a subject that not many people know about. And since it's a, it's a complete vacuum, there's no book, no other book published uh, on history of Haryana by a national publisher, which has, uh, you know, far reaching. So I was glad a friend of mine sent me a picture a, a week into uh, when the book was launched. And he sent me this picture from Pondicherry. Oh, wow. Found your book here and congratulations. And I was uh, pretty stoked, you know, uh, that, you know, the book or reading about Haryana has gone so far that people say in Pondicherry are, uh, you know, talking about the book. So, of course, I knew that it will be good because I have done, invested a lot of my time and did a lot of research. I've done fact check, cross check, re-referencing, everything was, a lot of effort was put into it to ensure that I'm bringing out a book, which, uh, you know, talks about the state and is fairly balanced. And a lot of effort has gone into ensuring that the book is balanced. Um, and because of all of those reasons, I thought that a book should do well. Uh, but then every book has a different journey. Everything in life, you, you never know. You just got to do your work. You got to do yeah. your bit, And then rest, leave it on uh, the gods. So whether, you know, good, good. And it will to start from what Bhagavad Gita also says then. So from this land itself. So yeah. yes, that's been... Um, but the book has been received well, which I'm pretty uh, happy about. I hope, uh, you know, we continue with the momentum and a lot more people uh, buy the book, read about the book and understand what the Northwestern region or the Northern region or, Del uh, you know, northwards from Delhi, what the region was about. 
and what the people and the culture of the state is. And I hope that in the near future, I'll write more about the state so that people at large uh, in India, as well as abroad, who want to understand Haryana or Haryanvis should have a good book to uh, refer to. So yes, uh, possibly going in the right direction and viewers also, whoever's watching right now, I really want you to pick the book, read and uh, give, you know, give me your feedback. I second that. Reader, uh, viewers, please do uh, t- uh, check it, uh, check his book out. It's really fascinating. You will not regret it. And the question I want to ask you, Arjun, is that your book came after the Olympics. So all these medals that we got and a lot of them coming from Haryana, especially the sensation Neeraj Chopra, right? So did you plan it that way? I doubt that was the <laughs> idea. Because I'm sure people had this question that what is Haryana? What is Haryana? Tell you so many sports people who go out and get medals as well. So what is the secret? So secret behind sports, it's it's the tradition. See, uh, Haryana has mostly for the major part of history been the semi-arid and arid land. And people have mostly been uh, agriculturists or pastoralists. And as a consequence of this, life was always tough. And uh, you have to be, you know, sort of dependent on the vagaries of the weather. You had to be dependent on limited resources. And as a, as a culture, it became very uh, ingrained into people that in order to lead, lead a good life, you've got to be physically strong. You've got to be mentally strong. You've got to be motivated. You know, I found it a little, uh, you know, people do talk about motivation. Uh, people do talk about how to, you know, all these self-help, uh, you know, groups or motivation lessons, they do talk about bringing motivations from outside, but what has happened in Haryana is, and what they also or tend to lose and, uh, you know, lose sight of it, that one very important aspect of doing whatever you do in life is self-motivation. So that self-motivation is the biggest factor, which drives you to do whatever you want to do. And when you're self-motivated, all those challenges that come your way are just regular roadblocks that you're ready to cross. Those are not big events that could stall your growth or stall your uh, stall your journey or the venture that you're taking. So, yes, so because Haryana as a tradition has been, uh, as a culture and a society has been coming up from very uh, turbulent times. And so people in generally became one, physically strong and two, mentally strong. So as to be passionate about doing whatever life throws at you and you know succeeding so that was always there but then what has happened recently is these passions and these uh, you know they they this drive has found a went out in the sporting arena so haryana for good for like last has always been you know a land which is given warriors, given uh, military men, given uh, soldiers into the armies and the forces. But then what happened of late is a lot of these military men and sportsmen, uh, military men and soldiers, they when they got back into their villages, they started talking about or started talking about the discipline of the army, the competitive nature of sports and things like that. And soon started gymnasiums and things like that. These gymnasiums and this drive to get into military, people were again active running four o'clock in the morning. If I, I've driven a lot in Haryana to do this research. So early in the morning, uh, say four 30, you would say you're driving from Panipat to Rotak. Uh, you would see on the highway, uh, you know, young boys, 16, 17, 18 years, 19, 20, 16 to 20 years back. It uh, running on the highway, just preparing themselves, keeping themselves physically fit for two reasons. One, of course, to keep themselves physically fit. Two is to train themselves for the, uh, you know, recruitment. Uh, that the army does. So this tradition, military brought back um, or military reignited that passion. But then a change happened in the sports policy also. Uh, At the break of the century, 21st century, Haryana, uh, you know, government very consciously started putting an effort to give the right motivation to the sports persons. So you'd see that sports persons are getting plots of land, the sports person are getting good uh, amount of money, they're getting a government job, uh, they're getting uh, some sort of a short uh, reward money. All of that worked as a great motivation also. So one, winning a medal for the country tops it all. Two, making the country proud 
having the flag on your chest or your back three having you know setting the right example in the community around you for then all of this this drive this passion that has been in people for this longest time because of this uh, huge 2000 and more than a 5000 years of history 2000 of recent history post the christian era uh, along with then giving them the right motivation and a platform to perform all that work together and then just is just raining down medals now <laughs> in fact um, i've written in the book also during the i, I believe it was the 2018 commonwealth games um in maximum one third of india's medals were won by haryanvis so it's it's a huge deal if you compare it to or try understanding that haryana is a very small state so small a state that uh, publishers or people in general would not want to write about it or publish about it but then this is the state where you've got national stars and icons coming out of so it's pretty impressive what haryanvi sportsmen are doing but then haryanvis are not just doing well in sports haryanvis are doing pretty well in media they are doing very well in uh, other creative fields business also for that matter uh, for example jindal group uh, navin jindal sanjan jindal par jindal for that matter is has uh, really put together a jindal uh, sports management and established ias and they are doing some really good work in uh, building the sporting ecosystem in the country uh, the family actually hails from haryana so is the z group they hail from haryana so you see uh, our businessmen have also done well we got on entrepreneurial spirit just that only of late uh, we've started getting the hogging the limelight uh, uh, because of these new, this new change and this uh, you know haryanvi has started uh, finding out finding their voice so yes that's been uh, something that's been the sporting journey of haryana but there are incredible stories by the way why i say so because you see uh, haryana na whenever anybody sees the sportsman or what he is achieved they see the medal they see the glamour they see the fame they see the fortunes that came along but if you go back understanding their stories now very basic very rugged very rural and uh, you know very simple innocent just this drive this passion to i'll do this i'll win a medal i'll win a medal you see that right whenever the media goes to their houses they have such simple living even jab wo baat karte hain it comes across that they are such simple such grounded people right in spite of all that they are doing absolutely and then another thing which i for some reason when it included in culture but yes haryanvi is have always so we mostly been vegetarian and then dairy loving people so dood dahi ka khana desa mein des haryana is something that everybody every haryanvi has heard and uh, has you know there's a stereotype about haryana also ke haryanvis love their milk they love their ghee they love their uh, dahi makkhan malai are they dhabas right wahan jao to dhabe pe to jana hi hai that's the other thing that dhabe pe ja rahe hain and what is the dhabas quality dhabe ke andar ye lassi bhi achhi milti hai aur uska ye makkhan kaisa aata hai सी वो वो है वो नेचर के अंदर है और इनफैक्ट दोपहर के अंदर यू वांट टू रिलेश सम फूड तो यू सी देयर इज दिस अ लॉट ऑफ हरियाणवीज आर प्रिपेयरिंग इन फॉर यूपीएससी सिविल सर्विसेज इन दिस राजेंद्र नगर एंड मुखर्जी नगर सो देयर इज अ जोक व्हिच सेज दैट अर्ली इन द मॉर्निंग सुबह सुबह दूध खत्म दोपहर में दही और लस्सी खत्म और रात को दारू खत्म सो सुबह सुबह ये इस एरिया के अंदर सुबह सुबह इधर खाने पीने पे ये दूध पीने पे जोर दोपहर के अंदर दही लस्सी चल रही है शाम को माहौल बनाने लड़के बट एट द एंड ऑफ द डे व्हाट व्हाट कॉट माय अटेंशन वाज द फैक्ट दैट यस दूध इज एन ऑब्सेशन मिल्क इज एन ऑब्सेशन अ नून में दही लस्सी हरियाणवीज आर प्रीटी फाउंड ऑफ इट एंड इट eat it in you know volumes and just passionately and which is what uh, which essentially and this is this is a by product of the agricultural or the rural life they were living in uh, because you're coming out of uh, you know hard labor farms are not easy to till and uh, no matter what modern machinery does and this modern machinery is only uh, recent in nature you know considering the wide scope of our uh, history Uh, but as a matter of fact it, it was only in recent times this modern machinery came in prior to that all were dependent on you know basic plows 
गाय भैंस के साथ uh, काम करना खेतों में एंड दैट इज हार्ड फिजिकल लेबर एंड वी कैन नॉट डिस्काउंट एनी डे द अमाउंट ऑफ एफर्ट इट टेक्स यू नो फॉर दैट ग्रेन ऑफ राइस और फॉर दैट ग्रेन ऑफ वीट और आटा और फ्लावर यू नो दैट जस्ट कम्स ऑन आर प्ले सो ऑल दैट टॉयल दैट हार्ड वर्क हाउ डू यू डू दैट यू डू यू हैव योर प्रोटीन्स कमिंग इन फ्रॉम द डेरी सो येस इट्स प्रेडी इनक्रेडिबल very very fascinating so arjun actually before i go on to go on to another question you mentioned that haryanis haryanis have done well in a lot of fields and you mentioned one trivia that relates haryana to nobel prize in pakistan do you want to talk about it oh yes uh, so very interesting thing uh, so in recent times so in in the last century one politician who has touched life of rural haryanvis uh and i say rural haryanvi is very uh, notably because that was politically speaking uh, what sir chotu ram did was ensure that the rural voters uh, he did some sort of a political polarization of ajgar so ajgar is ahir jat gujjar and rajputs so these four communities got together and started voting for him or his party uh back then so even the political uh, you know the way the modern indian polity is a by product of what the british started to doing during the colonial times and even that is not more than say 100 or 125 years old not more than that so uh, or around that so in that time elections were of course uh, held in a different way uh, and sir chotu nam was able to bring all these rural voters together and evolved himself as a leader of chatras biradri and sir chotu ram in that time uh, was able to build a very good ground base for himself in the ambala division of the bigger maha punjab and uh, won numerous elections and became a tall leader and a minister also uh, in pre independence india sir chotu ram at one point uh, started a thing called peasants welfare fund now peasants welfare fund was supposed to provide any kind of support scholarships incentives or money for some specific thing uh, to a lot of uh, to ruralites and the peasants so one beneficiary of uh, sir chotu ram's uh, peasant welfare fund was the former or you know the the first nobel prize winner uh, of pakistan now i can name narrate the entire story but i think it will be interesting for the readers to read the book and check it out but then what i've done is i've picked in that information where the nobel prize winners brother uh, acknowledges a fact uh, that see it was uh, sir chotu ram if it was not for sir chotu ram pakistan would not have won the first uh, you know the, the nobel prize so it's interesting another thing is uh, even uh, the first uh, prime minister of pakistan was a haryanvi he was from karnal which is around 125 kilometers from modern delhi yes, so back, yeah. yes so see uh, haryana's role is immense but it's so discounted that people don't uh, casually just don't talk about it and uh, the national media uh, shies away from uh, discussing it um arjun that brings me to this other question right um it's not only recent so you have covered a lot of medieval history of haryana and what i found very fascinating is that we we've, ta- we've always heard about maratha resistance to the mughals we've heard about the rajput resistance but never about some of these stories that you bring out from haryana so you cover you 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 spend a lot of time in the book talking about it but can you discuss like a couple of points couple of incidents from that time to get the viewers interested about yes. the mughal resistance that haryana yeah. has seen yes sure so what had happened is during the second half of aurangzeb's rule and which is also called as uh, you know the rule of the the early rule of the great mughals uh, in india uh it comes into question again wh- which part of india that they were ruling how much area they covered uh, that can be questioned and discussed and debated also but what was happening in aurangzeb's second half was a lot of rebellions had started and a lot of people had started revolting now uh as a consequence uh 
uh, not just revolts, and these revolts were not just uh, as a consequence. Aurangzeb's uh, power declined considerably. However, if one takes a careful look at these rebellions, one would see that there was some sort of uh, a, a, a vital religious angle in those rebellions, and then apart from the religious angle, there was this fierce opposition to the Mughal rule. Now, uh, there are various instances. So around Delhi, uh, there's an area, jo, you know, you go to Mathura, Aligarh, uh, Merat, you go further into uh, the Jaipur side, Bharatpur side, then you go further south in Indiana, Narnal area. Uh, all these places, there were many different communities who were living and these communities started rebelling against Aurangzeb and the Mughal rule. Uh, I begin the book by talking about one very important rebellion called the Satrami Rebellion. Now, a lot of aspirants and a lot of students of history, they read Satrami Rebellion with, without understanding or there's not history or the way history is taught, there's not enough contextualization uh, done, which is, which is the bane. I mean, which is, it, it's critical that it's in, it's critical that history, the way it's taught, it, students of history should be able to understand where it's happening and how it's happening and the reasons why it's happening. So Satanami rebellion is studied as a rebellion against the Mughal rule, but one does not see who were Satanamis or where it was happening. It was happening around 150 kilometers from modern Delhi in South of Haryana. There's a place called Narnal. I spent considerable time uh, in Narnal and understanding the local dynamics there. Uh, there are many local folklore stories attached to it, but Satanami is at one point became so ferocious and so rebellious against the Mughal rule that they started moving towards Delhi that they will defeat the Mughal emperor and, uh, you know, they'll defeat his armies and, uh, you know, change the rule. Uh, and Satanamis are not, you know, back in the day, uh, Satanamis were not a powerful force. Satanamis um, were a community of people. Uh, who were established in or settled mostly and around Natal, but they became, uh, you know, such uh, they, they became a community who was ready to face uh, the Mughal emperor, which tells a lot. Another thing that happening was such was the fear, or such was the fear of the Satramis in the in the eyes of the Mughal warriors of the Mughal soldiers that they refused to fight against the Satramis. So at this point, Aurangzeb had to make handwritten notes and or on the flags, he had to write some talisman and things like that and tie on their weapons and flags. So as to motivate the army, the Mughal army against the, uh, you know, the jihad against the Satramis or the uh, infidels. So you see, one is that, and I begin the book, uh, the chapter one with the same story. Another thing, of course, is the Jat rebellion that was happening in the Agra, Meerut uh, area, and uh, there's a long list of uh, you know people, uh, rajas, uh, consistently fighting against uh, the Mughal um, uh, repressions. So that also has been discussed has been discussed in the book. And then you see the Sikh rebellion. The Sikhs were pretty active in Punjab then, and by then they were uh, still trying to understand how to work out their own socio political life, um, and as that was happening, the Sikhs were also rebelling against the Mughals. So all of these players were always in negotiation. And by the end of, say, 18th century, Haryana had become a land of anarchy, uh, wherein the Mughals, the French, the English, the Sikhs, the Jats, uh, Satnamis, amongst others, uh, all were against or, you know, in a tough battle with the Mughals also with each other. So this land Haryana that you see today had become a land of uh, anarchy, uh, wherein everybody was just fighting for whatever, uh, you know, the money and the political power. And uh, you see this uh, strange uh, and very interesting, and it was a challenge writing it also, because you see, uh, now that things are settled a bit, now that things are, uh, you know, administratively, we were specified centers of administration, headquarters and things like that. But back in the day, they were the border, the borders between different territories were not very clearly defined and uh, villages were in conflict. The Sikh history for that matter makes it pretty interesting too. 
So all of this was happening in uh, Haryana in those days. So that rebellions, all those rebellions essentially led to the decline of the Mughal Empire, uh, slowly and gradually cutting down into which eventually came to a you know, proper end in 1857. However, in 1803, they had faced a brand. They had faced a brand in 1760s, 1750s, 1740s, 1730s, uh, 1710s, uh, even after 1707. So the, uh, that in 1857, the Mughal Empire was ultimately, uh, you know, uh, uh, or ended. Uh, one, there's a 150 years of history wherein consistently because of uh, politics, one would say, or military or rebellions, things like that, uh, the Mughal Empire was consistently declining as well, which I've discussed in my book about, you know, what was happening in the region of Haryana during those days. Yes. Actually, that, that makes for a very fascinating reading for sure, because a lot of it was not known. And now to think of it, right, Haryana lies on the route where a lot of invaders were also coming in from. So Mughals to Ekbar Agai, but then all the other invaders who kept coming from Afghanistan, they also came via Afga through Haryana itself. Yeah, right? yes. Lots of battles were fought in Haryana, Panipat region, all those places. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, Arjun, the thing is, how did people go about with their life in a situation like this, where every now and there, then there were strikes and struggles and things like that. So how were the societies organized around that time? And is there any implication to today's Haryana based on what the society structure had formed at that time? Great. Uh, very nicely put and a nice question there. Uh, see, uh, right. So for anybody, and I say this, uh, you know, with one has to take it with a pinch of salt that Haryana, what it is today is also because it's a consequence of what was happening in Delhi. People wanted or the invaders wanted to capture Delhi or Agra. For them, it was important to battle it out and how, where do they battle it out? So there were consistent battles happening in all the places in Haryana, like a lot of places in Haryana. So Shahabad, Ambala, Karnal, Panipat, Sonipat, Sirsa, Hisar, um, Fatehabad, Ratia, Rania, uh, all of these places, Sarhind Ke Paswala, all these places became prominent conflict zones because uh, in order to defend Delhi, uh, one would be stepping out and step Jahape, you know, you go northwards towards finding a place where they'll battle it out. So invaders must be coming in from north and to, in order to defend Delhi, Haryana became a land where these battles are fought. And see, battles are and, and you see these battles consistently happening. Uh, very easily we say there are three prominent battles happening uh, in Haryana, for example, 1526, in Panipat, 1526, 1556, 1761. Karnal happened in 1739. And Kunjpura, you just see the place and try picking the gazette records. You'll find that every place was has seen some sort of a, a proper conflict. And Haryana as a result, uh, face the brunt of it. Uh, no land, see, where prosperity, riches, all of these come with some stability. But where is the stability? Haryana had become a battleground for defending Delhi. As a result, a lot of, uh, you know, that what we call the, so to say, the prosperity did not really seep down, say, an empire was established here. But to answer your question, there are different people who've written about what Haryana was in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And uh, a very interesting account that, uh, apart from all the other things that I've written and talked about, I'd like to mention that Charles Metcalf in uh, his works, somebody else's works, where make a characteristic mention of how or what Haryana was during the day, and which was, uh, most of it was village life. But it's important that it's mentioned like that villages in Haryana are like little republics. They are self-dependent. The communities are interrelated and they go about their business as usual. And whenever there comes a challenge, the village faced it together. Now, this is in line with what, mod, what the Gotra system or what the Khap system is also like. But before I go into this argument, let me first clarify what I mean by what Haryana or Haryana or Haryanvis were in the 18th century. Sturdy people, tough people, you could, uh, you know, you would have to battle them out if you want to bring them into, you know, subordination. And they would go about different communities, would go about their professions. 
back in the day consultancy was not a profession <laughs> back in the day media houses were not a thing so the profession that people in general were um, you know engaged in was uh, they were either agriculturists pastoralists um, and then each community was divided into the work that they were doing but village as a unit was dependent the communities were dependent on each other and they'll go about their work all they would and a significant part came the moguls or afghans or whoever came uh, they the village as together they would give the revenue to the government and they were fairly not bothered or you know uh, the village community was not repressed so much however when the british came uh, and the records make a clear mention of it that when the british came they damaged this village structure uh they changed the administrative structure they changed the different administrative policies they changed the judicial structure so all of those changes um uh, changed the society significantly for example and one of the things uh, uh there's a mention of uh, how in in a village uh if one is brought to you know amongst the community uh, or the village elders Uh, somebody has committed a sin or a crime he's brought together an open audience and uh, he's asked if he's you know committed the crime uh, so the the man or the sinner at that time has to decide he cannot lie he cannot perjure perjure himself because if he did he has to face the you know some sort of boycott from the community or things like that but when the courts were there and well that's not the time when rti's or mobile phones were there so a man could lie in the court and then the onus of proving him wrong was on the other party so one could lie also in the court so these these things are mentioned in records and uh, it's interesting from this change that was happening in haryanvi society in the 18th century but then uh, people would just prior to that people would go about their regular work but then there's a another thing that i would like i would like to mention how uh, whenever there was a war or there's a conflict either people would battle it out or if they would don't want to battle it out they'll pick their regular uh, you know the the most precious commodities and go to a different village or go to you know their neighbors or their family in other village a year later or sometime later they'd come back where their houses and their because everything there were small uh, communities right no one uh, and when community would sit together and you know if there was a question of ke bhai xyz was my house number i am supposed to live there now that we've come back nobody would say no and there there was a sense of this civic responsibility because the communities were also small however this change started to happening in modern times and with a lot of money that has poured in um, interestingly people would also vacate their homes and go elsewhere if uh, the weather got bad or if the crop failed so if the weather is pretty bad and uh, the crop won't you know uh, give enough revenue or enough to eat people would vacate and go to some other village and they'll they'll sow their crops so that is how you see in haryana there are numerous villages uh, uh, so will, people will move from or families move from one village to another village and they establish their new families or new uh, kunba there uh, that's how gotras have moved from one place to the other that is how different castes have moved from one place to other and then you also learn about how uh, you know a family starts from one village and in the neighborhood establishes a small another small village which is usually called khedi so all those things happen um, that that's how the village community and uh, you know the structures and their life usually was however this uh, in in this book castes castes of punjab and castes and races or races of punjab is a book um, i i believe i made a reference of that in the book or in my book also where the british historians and gazette recorder and gazette record uh, record keepers have made an account of uh, the people their nature and their simplistic ways and it's very interesting to read about them because uh, in rural haryana which is of course a lot is changing i'm not saying that not much has changed 
uh, a lot is changing but you still you still see that uh, you know that simple nature that you could connect to what was happening or what the british have written about it 200 years ago so uh, that's been that's been a real pleasure you know while researching the book uh, establishing those dots and making those connections arjun you mentioned about the villages being like republics and you mentioned about khap now khap the much reviled khap right when people outside think it's all bad um i want you to weigh in on the khap system how it was it's something that has lasted for so long clearly it had a utility value even if we don't recognize it now right so i just want you to talk about how it helped haryana if at all and if it is changing now or, or rather what have been the changes now is it relevant today not relevant today something that people outside of haryana should know because otherwise they are khap are baap le you know that kind of impression see so what has happened is see khaps are a, they one it should be clear that khaps are not a judicial institution they are a social institution khaps were a product of the way society used to be and the the way society lived and it was responsible to the society itself so it's a very democratic institution if one is to understand it um, in in how in in that terminology however uh, and khaps uh, as an institution have had an immense impact on haryana on haryanvis on the village communities very much uh, for for thousands of years uh, since the society has been khap in fact cannot be discounted however in recent times khaps one became slightly or you know in many cases more politicized two khaps are what are they question about their question for that their patriarchal institutions uh their question on that they are regressive and orthodox see uh, about any social institution uh similar arguments can be made because see society has to progress and this churn always keeps on going on in this society khaps if they are uh, regressive or patriarchal or any other or ten other bad things whatever anybody wants to say realize it that they are reflection of a society and the society will change and khaps will change likewise however what third point what is happening is that every time a conversation on khap begins either you know uh, people a sector section of people would say that their patriarchal section would say that regressive so on and so forth see at the end of the day understand that they are not you know for for a, a think tanker in delhi it's not an institution for him or her for a bollywood actress uh, doing very well in mumbai khap is not meant for her khap is meant or khap is doing whatever khap is doing for people who are in the immediate vicinity of uh, the village or where they 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 hold some um, you know value and impact then another thing what happens is due to this media glare or media attention or trp value only the wrong decisions or the regressive decisions of the khaps are highlighted uh of course khaps through the history and there's long documented and multiple papers on the subject also where khaps have done some incredible things and they have been talked about and people well meaning people in the society uh do treat khaps with respect and whenever they see that some decision of the khap is wrong the khap gets together or people send their feed and now khaps are also going on whatsapp also uh people send messages on whatsapp essentially ke bhai this decision by this khap uh is not right so people will reach out to the khap pradhan the president or the head of the khap and tell him ke we should do something about it so treat it as a social institution another important thing that is happening is khaps have become immensely politicized very political and they have now moved out so when it was a social institution there's a different deal but when you become political institution or a social institution tries to become a little more politicized then it slowly starts to wear down and people don't give it as much of respect or people and then there each khap will have different uh, you know section of people or different lobbies that has also happened and then because of this modern institution that our wonderful country has become uh, the polity the judicial system uh, khaps has totally started to 
their values have decreased or uh, value when i say not values the value of the institution has slowly declined as the society is progressing um, caste was an important factor in khaps uh, gotras were an important factor it still is an important factor in khap uh, discussions or khaps however uh, in the modern india that is it's become very uh, you know it, it's a corporate setup now uh, the world is changing very quickly uh, so that that change is happening what can be seen in the khap uh, understanding politics and the society too yes thank you for this very thought through answer uh, arjun one other I thing that, that addressed uh, you know the doubts because why i say so that because it's very easy to just talk about anything condescendingly or just negate everything or reject everything uh, without you know understanding it consciously ke there are pros and cons to almost everything in life and uh, life does not happen in as much uh, we would want it to write that happen. in the book as well right you brought out quite some instances where khaps have played an important role i yeah. remember this one very clearly where you talk about this nawab who had this terrible practice ki wahan se koi bhi stri jayegi the newly married woman and the nawab would first say that first i will sleep with this girl and then she goes ahead and it's the khaps who got together and fought against the nawab right so very khaps played a very important role in the 1857 first war of independence also uh, in the 1857 war of independence the khaps got together uh, there's there's actually a stone roller uh, which is kept in sonipat uh you know rebels or freedom fighters were you know they were, the roller was rolled on to them and wahan par during the 1857 struggle uh, a lot of these khaps played an active role in rallying people together uh for the cause so all those things of course have happened and khaps have played an immense role yes so one other thing uh, arjun i want to ask is um in the previous elections when manohar lal khattar was made the cm right i very clearly remember that there was this discussion going on that are this is a very wrong step because aisa hua hi nahi hai it has never happened that haryana can have a non jat cm and then manohar lal khattar was like a risky bet of course he has stayed on after that so there is a very strong jat association jat gurjar association with haryana so just just let, tell us about this who are jats who are gujars what is this people composition of uh, haryana and what is it why was this whole discussion to begin with that a jat no a non jat couldn't become a cm of course that is sort of too wrong now but what is what was the dynamic going on or what is the dynamic okay so see prior to 1947 uh, when india was still under the british rule uh, the composition of haryana was jats major jats rangars uh, rangars were muslim rajputs Uh, muslim jats then gujars uh, and then ahirs in the southern part of haryana but then right after independence the first wave of uh, migrants from uh, lahore or punjab side in, you know in pakistan started coming in a lot of them settled in uh, well in punjab a lot of them came into what modern haryana is but haryana significantly uh, kurukshetra for that matter was one of the biggest or if not the biggest one of the one of the biggest camps or uh, uh, refugee camps so a lot of people who post independence came in were settled in kurukshetra and then consequently later settled in different parts of delhi and haryana too so the composition uh, the social composition the caste composition the community composition first began changing in 1947 it was a very critical event uh, and more exploration should be done about it and i've done it a fair bit in my book also and uh, the second shift it, it was not as significant also happened in 1984 now what happened was that for jats who could or gujjar families or rangar families who could trace their lineage to multiple generations being in haryana and then there were other uh, the punjabi migrants who were khatris essentially they call uh, them punjabis because they came from the punjab uh, pakistan punjab or punjab in pakistan uh, that is why but they are khatris and uh, you know other uh, khatris are usually hindu traders and merchants of uh, punjab area so that happened uh, there is a thought 
that uh, in haryana and people believe that they'll only be a jat cm but that's not the case but that that argument is based on the fact that jats are a majority in haryana and when they say majority there are around 25 to or 30 32 33% of jats in haryana and which is why many people outside haryana they consider that everybody who's from uh, you know haryana is a jat or haryana is a jat land Haryana is a Jat majority land, or if not Jat majority, right thing would be to say the most, uh, you know, the maximum composition uh, of Haryana would be a, a community which predominates as Jats. Haryana, since independent, uh, since the formation of the modern state, has had many Jat CMs. For example, Bansi Lal was a Jat, Tau Devi Lal was a Jat, Bupendra Singh Hoda was a Jat, Bhajan Lal, however, uh, was a Bishnoi. he claimed to have jat origins that his gotra is a jat but he is a bishnoi he is a follower of bishnoi sect so he would pander on to non jat politics so there is a jat vote segregation or polarization and there is a non jat polarization this jat versus non jat political polarization has essentially led to this idea that you know a non jat cm uh, would not happen or cannot happen this thought process however that's not uh, the case manohar khatter has been the chief minister for more than uh, you know 7 years now and uh, doing a fairly good job at it uh, although you know of course like every chief ministership there are pros and cons there are debates discussions that will keep on going but this idea of jat versus non jat or a political polarization started beginning in the during chhotu ram days also sir chotu ram was active in the pre independence era and during few of his campaigns the jat versus non jat thing started also the same thing was repeated during professor shade singh's uh, or tau devilal's you know era also so professor during the professor shade singh time uh, however professor shade singh is considered one of those people who never pandered into jat politics uh, or caste politics his only idea was progressive and uh, bridging that caste barriers uh and that is how it should be it is important to not see once one person or anybody just with his caste angle because because that adds to division in society as that adds to the divisive nature of you know the the human mind uh it is important to bridge those caste barriers and not think imagine get into public life with that caste angle however consistently in haryana this caste politics has been pandered upon this is also the reason why haryana has failed to find out its individual haryanvi identity punjabis see themselves as punjabis jats see themselves as jats brahman would see themselves as brahman gujjar would see themselves as gujjar yadav would see as yadav which in effect uh, in this entire process haryana suffers uh, so this political polarization Uh, uh has happened consistently however it would not be fair to say uh that non jat cms have not been successful bhajan lal for a case in point has been a one of a, one of the very successful uh chief ministers of haryana successful in the same he was uh, the cm for a very long term and uh, he pandered to non jat politics in fact the first chief minister of haryana was also not a jat uh he was a brahman the second chief minister was a yadav he was a rao grinder singh so you see that has not happened however there is a stereotype which has established consistently and one of this one of the reasons is because of the recent history in the 21st century as india you know got into the 21st century uh, om prakash chotala who was a jat was a chief minister of haryana right after that another chief minister of haryana was bupendra singh hooda who was a jat he got another term so he became two time cm so for three terms since the beginning of the century the three uh, the two cms and three terms of these cms have been jats so the idea came in but it is important and uh, which uh, it is important to see public life political life social life not from a caste angle the caste could stay private the caste could stay in only that community discussions however haryana as a state and haryanvis as people need to start thinking about evolving a common identity if uh, you know one is to work well and you know imagine that the state or potentially what the state can be 
i hope that uh, you know yeah yeah no no very clear it's actually very fascinating from uh, it was when i was reading right that hum jaat jaat karte hain but the, so there have been chief ministers who have been non jaat manohar lal khatter is actually not the first one as yes those who don't know haryana politics would think because of the discussions that were going on so yeah yeah definitely so, very, people, very sir, back in the day i remember these early conversations with people uh, you know about haryana uh someone would do something wrong and people would just randomly say that he's a jat you don't know which caste he belongs to you don't know which religion he belongs to just that he is from haryana he's a jat yeah that's a jat hai ha is it that's that's a you know the uh, i mean there should be more sanity in public discourse <laughs> that's all no i'm sure your book will make that happen Uh, Arjun, my last question, and I think this will still be—I um, mean, it will be still a very open-ended question. You've named the book "The Land of Gods," and in a lot of your talks, you've explained why you've explained the meaning of Haryana and all of that. But apart from that, what I also found very interesting, एक तो ये है कि we talk about wars. We know that Kurukshetra was is in Haryana, so it starts all the way from there, right? उसके भी पहले परशुराम जी की जो कहानी आती है, the five lakes he created, all that has been in Haryana. But that apart, what I found very interesting is that hindu ho muslim ho sikh sikh ho there have been so many sects which have originated either have originated in haryana or have had a tremendous impact in haryana unlike any other state jaise one is arya samaj right of course gujarat also had a significant impact of arya samaj but haryana definitely even though dayanand saraswati ji was not from haryana the kind of impact, yeah. Yeah, so haryana when we talk about arya samaj it sort of gets linked to haryana the other is the tablikis we were talking about the tablikis now i have met tablikis in indonesia but the origin is haryana yeah. unke pehle the wahabi movement that started again the origin is haryana so what is it about haryana and religion and sect that uh, uh, all these sects that keep emerging and actually even tying the same people into it like it keeps pulling people into it yes uh, so one one has to consider and give due consideration to the fact that this civilization and you know this uh, i wade into uh, answering why the book is titled land of the gods that modern india is called bharat uh, and the name of the tribe is taken the tribe used to be residents of haryana the vedas which are the most important uh, texts and most revered texts of hindus across india and the world uh, were written on the banks of saraswati river which flowed on these lands then of course mahabharata the the wonderful book that you've written also on uh, you know the wonderful epic that you wrote a book on uh, it the mahabharata happened here the bhagavad gita sar the the for the entire iskon community all over the world uh the bhagavad gita was uh, the sermon was given here on these lands so haryana has since the very beginning of modern indian civilization or hindu civilization it has played a very important role and has been central in um, you know in those discussion in that process uh going by the same tradition haryana has had consistently uh a very private relation with the god or how one sees gods so be it the baniyas the agarwals be it uh, the jats be it rajputs be it khatris anybody on these lands uh, religion has been a very private affair but personal affair but very deeply devout nature uh, of the people uh, you know it was a consequence of that deep, deeply devout nature of the people now rightly said uh, there are many movements which have had this similar impact in haryana for example you spoke about arya samajis arya samaj has had a, a such a huge impact on haryana that i would say till the break of the last century haryana was the most important in, uh, movement or social religious reform movement or 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 a sect or community of people who made uh, impact in haryana social life as well as political life uh, and i categorically say political life also apart from that uh, the wahabi is one but tablighi is an interesting example because uh, the tablighi jamaat uh, 
be, got into the center of this entire discourse and discussion as the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, took the world by storm. Uh, because uh, the Tablighi Jamaat was founded in the Southern Haryana area of Mewat, uh, very close to Nu. And there in 1920s, this Jamaat uh, started to, you know, take roots and essentially became uh, uh, a an Islamic institution, Islamic religious school, which is spreading the ideas of how, uh, you know, people should be or how Muslims should be more devout and more, uh, uh, you know, follow those specific religious practices. Important thing is why he did it in Mewat or why did it happen there? That is an interesting history, which one should read in the book. But then uh, Mewat's history is another very interesting history uh, which makes an important part of Haryana, uh, the cultural composition, people have uh, changed their religion, but their names are Hindus. Uh, they, they have Hindu names. They practice uh, Hindu festivals. They take part in processions and proceedings like Hindus would. But um, when, when, when they are asked about the religion, they're Muslims. So, and that is what Molana Ilyas saw when a congregation of Mayos uh, visited Delhi and then he decided he'll make a trip to Mewat and then as they say it's the rest is history in the last hundred years uh, Mewat and uh, Tablighi Jamaat and uh, the area and the community has seen an immense transformation which of course uh, you know is, is a topic for uh, a bigger uh, you know and a different discussion but yes, uh, apart from them, of course, there are many Babas, there are many Nath Sampradayas, uh, uh, which have immense following in Haryana and the villages of Haryana also. Uh, and villages is essentially where uh, a lot of their followers uh, are coming from. Uh, there are, you know, there's a long list of tradition. Sirsa ke andar, you'll see Hisar mein, you see there Ban Rotak, Rivadi, there are different. Oh, and then, I, and I believe that it's all uh, you know, as a result of that same thought process, um, which has been ingrained in uh, Haryana and Haryanis for this longer time, that, uh, you know, no matter what uh, anybody else calls it, uh, we are pretty much, uh, you know, uh, devout or <laughs> religious people. And that is why this book is titled, and that is why the state is also aptly titled Land of the Gods, uh, the abode of God. And... Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arjun. This was very, very fascinating, very interesting. And I mean, there are quite some parts of the book which are still untouched. We still haven't explored them, especially the pre-medieval, right? You started speaking about Saraswati. Uh, but we have not talked about given the constraint of time. So I would request the readers, do pick up the book, do check it out. You will definitely not regret it. It's, it's written very simply. That's the other thing about the book. Talking about Haryana and even though you have so many references, it doesn't feel like a heavy read at all. It's a very simple read. So, um, yeah, all the best to that you. Was, and, uh, that was the idea to, you know, write it simply because I remember if I'm, if I write there um, and numerous conversations with a lot of writers of late, that the book should be written so simply that, uh, you know, people just read it through. We, we read it through. It should not come out, you know, with each line should be telling you something. Uh, it should be good information. But at no point it should be uh, so loaded or the written so, you know, with complicated English that it becomes a challenge. Yeah. So that was uh, what I had in mind. And I'm glad uh, that you're sharing this, that, you know, probably I was able to do it. So thank you very much. Fantastic. And all the best for all your endeavors. Thank, thank you, you very so much. Namaste. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Varta podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharat Vartha to facilitate long-form discussions on politics, policy, and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharat Vartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website, www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care and jai.